Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Well, let's be honest. honest honestly, there's no, uh, there's no Hollywood movie that could ever be compared to the stories that we read in the Bible. Um, Hollywood has nothing on the Bible. Hollywood has nothing on God. But let me tell you something. But there is a great depiction between what took place in Star Wars. I mean, I know there's like 50 million Star Wars, but um, this is one of my my, uh, my favorites. After watching it, I didn't think I liked Star Wars that much, and then I watched this. And I'm like, wow, this is this this is called uh, I think the the Awakening, and um, and I I love it because. We, we know that the battle is always within us, and we do have an adversary, um, just like you see in Star Wars. You have the blue, which represented the, the blue saber was the good, and then the red saber represented the bad, the evil. And, um, and the, as I watched it, I started thinking, man, all these different uh, Star Wars movies that were created, there's like a theme, an ongoing theme through all of them. And you know what that theme is? Identity. Every single one of them were always struggling, trying to discover who they really are. But I believe that the church is no different. I believe that there are people that are far away from God that have identity issues. But I also believe that there's a lot of people in the church, people that have been walking with God, whether it's been six months, one year, five years, ten years, fifteen years, that are also struggling with who they are in Jesus. Why? Because the truth is this, is that every single one of us have a past. All of us. No one gets away from a past. Now, I don't know what your past looks like, but maybe there's people here that have a past divorce. And you're still living behind that divorce. And you're still identifying with, with that divorce. Divorce is not who you are. Divorce is what happened. Or maybe you're sitting here today and you've had some hurt, some pain. You've been betrayed. You've had some losses. But whatever the reason is, you have a past that keeps trying to haunt you and keep you in this place of, of hiding yourself behind it. And, and how many know that God, God does not want any single one of us living in a past of anything. He wants us living in the future that he has for every single one of us. In that future, he says, I have a hope with future, and that's what he has for every single one of us. But as we watch this movie and we look at uh, the girl, uh, notice they gave her a name. They labeled her. Like many of us right now, you're wearing clothing and you got a label on you right now. And if I can, if I, can I can go walk around and ask you who you're wearing and, and you tell me what your label is. You know, there's a label on my shirt. And uh, uh, like this, this is Zara. I, I, can, I can work it if you'd like to. <laughs> this is Zara. Yeah, I like Zara. But see, Zara is not who I am. Zara is what I'm wearing right now. And I want you to know right now that that this girl was labeled the scavenger. In other words, she was this girl that, that was struggling with trying to find out who she was, and they labeled her with this name. Why? Because of what she did. What did she do? She looked for scrap. And, of course, as she looked for scrap, she would go back to the place where they would buy all this scrap, and then they would tell her her worth. And they would say, what you have is at a value of, and then they would give her the worth of whatever. But it really does speak of us. So many of us identify our worth based on what we do. Most of us identify our worth based on the titles that have been given to us. And that is also a false way of living life. Little by little, we, saw, we start identifying with the clothes we wear, the cars we drive, the money we make, the bank accounts we have the homes, all those things. And it's a dangerous place because then you just live your life trying to live for the accolades. And you're trying to live just for that white picket fence and that beautiful house when God created you beyond all those things. God made you in his image and you're like him. And I pray that today that we do have a great awakening of what God really has for every single one of us. How many here have a past? We all do. Some of us have some extreme past, but forget how bad it was, because I, I can be here and tell you all my stories of how sad my past is, and you can come and, and bring me your past, and we can go ahead and, and go head on on our past, and I'll be like, oh, yeah, well, you think that was bad? How about blah, blah, and we would just get into a whole, you know, match of who has the worst past, but a past is a past. A hurt is a hurt, 
A loss is a loss, and that's the reality. And so as this girl is um, in this horrible situation, she's obviously identified by, by a bunch of people as someone being just a, a scavenger. You heard um, the, uh, the, the guy that was struggling, uh, and I for, trust, I'm not all a Star Wars guy, but he said something like, you, you let that scavenger, you let that scavenger have power over you. And let me tell you something, I come from a scavenger lifestyle, but then I met Jesus. And, and let me tell you something, the enemy's greatest fear is that you would come and find out who you are in Christ Jesus. Man, because God forbid that you come to the fullness of Christ, because if you just did that, you are dangerous in the kingdom. You are dangerous. And God wants you to be dangerous in his kingdom. He wants you to make sure that you know that you have all power and all authority over every single work of the enemy. See, there's nothing that you can face in this life that God hasn't already given you the power. Come on, the force be with you to overcome that situation. But, uh, but we see the story as well. We see the, that little robot, that uh, BB-8. He comes along. The scavenger meets him. And, uh, and he's also trying to find his 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 discovery of his purpose but one thing that we know about bb8 is that he had a map on the inside that would lead her to luke skywalker who she was trying to discover well guess what you also have a bb8 it's called the holy bible and the holy bible is your road map that leads you to jesus christ and it's only in him that you'll ever find out who you are it's only in that word. Without that word, let me tell you something, you'll never find out who you really are. Without this word, you'll never find out what God did for you. In this word, you'll never find out what God wants to do with you. Have you noticed that it's not our future that shapes us and molds us? It's our past that shapes us. It's our past that molds us. And I know that there are so many people that say, well, you can't let your environment dictate who you're becoming. But the truth is this, is that everyone has a different story. For example, me, I grew up in the hood. I grew up in a very violent community. Back in my days, oh, let me tell you something, gangs today would be a joke. It would be a laughter to see how gangs do things today. In my days, people were being murdered in broad daylight. Every single day, every night, I would hear the gunshots. Every day, I had to, there was either flight or fight. I didn't have a choice to flight. It was time to fight. And so I was constantly challenged. And you know what happened is this, this environment really started shaping and molding the kind of person I became. I became very angry. I became very violent. I became very abusive. Why? It shaped me. My past was just literally just every single day just forming me and forming me. And, and I know unless you've been through a lifestyle like that, I always tell people, if I were you, I would zip the lip. Because you weren't there. That's my story. You can Listen, you can argue theology, but you can't argue my story. But Jesus. Amen. But Jesus, but Jesus, but Jesus. And so I'm not trying to say that, you know, woe is me. I'm trying to say that, yeah, woe was me until Jesus met me and I met Jesus and it was changed completely. So you do begin to begin to uh, be shaped and formed by your past. And, and I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's not easy. Um, I, love, I love the fact that in, in the scriptures, like this movie Star Wars, uh, there, were, there were men like the Apostle Paul. And, and the Apostle Paul was someone that uh, studied the, the old prophets, the masters, uh, a.k.a. the old Jedis. And he would study their lifestyle and he would study their stories and, and he would try to draw some wisdom and insight. You know what you can do? Um, it's, it's awesome to learn from people of the past that, that have overcome the issue that, that's your present today. And, and so the Apostle Paul looked at the issues that the old prophets were dealing with and, and he started studying them and, and he learned one thing and he, and, and he put it in the scripture for you and I to read it. Philippians 3.13, look at this. Now, I know we've all read this verse before, but I promise you not everybody lives this. You may believe it, but believing and doing are two different things. Look, he said this, I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. Accomplish what? What is this? This is your past. What past are you hiding behind? What past is defining you right now? 
What past are you holding on to that you can't release? Because Paul finally realized that there is no way that he can depend on his own strength to accomplish coming out of his past. And look what he says. He says, however, I do have one compelling focus. And that one compelling focus is this. He says, I forget all of the past and I fasten my heart to the future instead. Dang. That's easier said than done, huh? Because too many of us are living our past today. And I know that there are people that sometimes can be so religious and be like, no, praise God, I've already been delivered of my past. Yeah, then why haven't you forgiven your mom? Oh, we don't want to go there. <laughs> yeah, why haven't you forgiven your dad? There are people sitting in this church today and all day there's all kinds of people walking through this church. There are people that are walking in here that are still holding a grudge with family members that are not even on this earth anymore. They're passed on. They're dead. But you're still living the past today. The moment you even mention their name, listen, here's how you know you've forgiven someone. If you walk into a room and someone starts talking about that individual who hurt you, if that still stings you, you haven't forgiven. You know you've let go when you can walk in a room, you hear that individual's name, and it doesn't mean diddly squat to you. It just reminds you of how faithful God is and how he set you free from that hurt and pain. Amen? Come on, can we give God a big hand clap for that? So he says this, however, I do have one thing I do. He says the one thing I do is I forget all of the past and as I and I fasten my heart, my heart, come on, out of the heart flows the issues of life, right? Out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth speaks. Everything comes out of this beautiful little thing called the heart. And he says, I've learned to fasten my heart on his future. Easier said than done. But there's going to be a great awakening. I, I love this too. Um, the evil side, my, my son is a Star Wars fanatic. So I woke him up early this morning. He was like, eh, what? I'm like, so tell me about this. Like, like what's the evil and what's the good? Like, what, how would you describe him? He's like, dad, it's simple. He said, the evil is called the first order. I'm like, the first order. I'm like, okay. That's kind of, I'm like, I can totally play off that. I'm like, because you know what? Every single one of us. We had a first order of our destructive, dysfunctional way. There was a first order of Mauricio, who was cray-cray. You know what I'm saying? Who was just, just loco, out there, hurting, doing crazy stuff. And, and, and you know what? It makes sense why the enemy would be called first order. Because he wants to keep you in the order of your former ways. Because God forbid you leave the first order and you become a person on the good side. You know who the good side is? He says the good side is called the resistance. I was like, dang, the resistance? He's like, yeah, dad, the resistance are the people that fight the first order. I'm like, well, isn't that a biblical truth? Can I give you a Bible verse for that? Look at this. Look, look. James 4, 7 says this. He says, so then. Surrender to God. Stand up to the devil or stand up to the first order and resist. Everybody say resist. And resist him and he will not only turn but he'll run from you and he'll leave you alone. He says but move your heart closer and closer to God and he will even come closer to you. Huh? You want to know how to live the resisted life of God, you have to learn how to submit to God first. See, so many of us are trying to resist the devil. Well, how come that's not leaving me? Well, how come that's not going? Because you are too proud to submit. See, submitting to God means I have to submit my ideology. I have to submit my own opinion. I have to submit my own fears. I have to submit my own thoughts. I have to submit my, my attitude, right? Some of us don't want to give up that attitude because it's that attitude that has kept you going, but God wants to renew you, but we're so accustomed to our past, and we love living it in our present, and then we wonder, why can I not resist the devil? Because we have to have the power to submit to God, and how do I submit? 
you got to submit whatever issue you have right now. Whatever hurt, you got to submit it to God. It's not, listen, it doesn't go away on its own. Without you submitting it to God, it doesn't flee. He says, submit to God, then resist the temptation to stay bitter, resist the temptation to stay angry, resist the temptation to, to be a hater of maybe people that have hurt you in the past, and just submit all those things. Let that be your compelling force that when you think about what someone did to you, man, I'm able to give that to God. Listen, here's what life is like. Life is like an elevator. This is called Elevate Church, right? All right, well, just pretend you're all in an elevator. All right. Life is like an elevator, and on your going up and on your way up, sometimes you got to hit stop, ding, and you got to let some people off. Because the people that have hurt you in the past are going to keep you stuck, and the only one that's going to get hurt is you. It's okay. Sometimes people have to be let off in order for you to go way up. Huh? Some of us need to keep going to deliver. Stop it and get rid of that attitude. <laughs> attitude of unforgiveness, uh, get off. Huh? Attitude of, why are they doing church at the movies or movies at the church? Get off. <laughs> oh, you want to hear that now, huh? <laughs> why do we have to do that? Have... Eat your popcorn. <laughs> resist. Everybody say Resist. Come on, the church has to be the resistance. Come on, you are the resistor, not the complainer. You are the resistor, not the whiner. You are the resistor, not the weak. When you're weak, he's strong. Amen? When you can't, he can. When you won't, he will. Come on, that's the resistance of God. Can I get an amen for that one? Come on, resistant fighters know how to submit to God. Huh? I'm preaching it. Uh, don't worry, I got you. I'll never forget as I was, you know, as I came to Christ, there was a lot of stopping in my elevator. But I'll never forget my French teacher. And I'm, listen, I, I get it. I wasn't a good kid. Uh, I went to six high schools and... And it wasn't because I wasn't academically challenged enough. It was because I just didn't, I just didn't care. Um, and so I wasn't very respectful. But there was a teacher that looked at me, and, and I'll never forget it. I can still see her angry face to this day. I, I've forgiven her. But, uh, but I can still see it. You know, uh, when you forgive someone, it doesn't mean you forget it. It just means that you forgave them. And so... Uh, and so I remember she looked at me, and she was this angry woman, just, just yelled all in, like literally spit coming out of her mouth. And just, you are, you are gum under a shoe, and you are worthless, and you will never mount up to nothing in your life. And, of course, you know what, Mr. I don't give a rip, you know, because I'm all that in a bag of tortillas, you know. <laughs> I was like, you know what, Psh, whatever. Yeah, whatever really affected me deeply. But I reached a place where I had to, on my way up with God, I had to go ahead and stop at some moment. And I had to address that issue and say, okay, Mrs. I won't say her name because she's watching. <laughs> <laughs> you need to get off. And then, and then listen, and then I, and now a, lot of, a lot of you men, let me tell you something. You can deny it all you want, but most of us men, we got daddy issues. We got daddy issues. That's why it's difficult for men to ever come to the complete truth and knowledge of God because you have a father, an earthly father issue. Until you finally get your heart healed concerning your father. Here's what I always tell people because my father didn't do a good job. That's just up front, honest. I love him. But he did some very hurtful, harmful, painful things. I mean, I'm talking like, like, the woman he was with burned the house down with us in it. And by God's grace, uh, alive today, the, my, my aunt had to bust the window out and get me out of the room through a window. And so it's a miracle. So just think about year after year, just chewing on that, just thinking about it. What do you think that does to a man? You know, it does, it gets you bitter, gets you angry. 
But, I, but, I, but as you grow in Christ, the one who matures hopefully is you. And I realize, you know what? Yeah, my father was a jerk, but I remember when I was a jerk too. Yeah, my father was a loser, but I remember when I was a loser too. And the same grace that God has bestowed on me is the same grace I have to bestow on him. I ended up leading my father to Christ 21 years later. 21 years later, I led my father to Jesus. Today, he's a leader in his church, and he's been restored. He's been married like three times, but. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to make a decision. I had to get him off the elevator. I hope I'm speaking to someone today. Amen. Because some of you, listen, you're waiting for that person to heal you. Tell me how that's working for you. If you're waiting for someone to get it right with you, you may be waiting till your deathbed for them to come and say, I'm sorry, yet you live like hell all your life. No. Submit to God. Resist the temptation. Resist the devil. And he will not only turn from you, that fool will run from you. Amen. I want to see some demons running. How about you? Come on. All right, quick story, perfect person, perfect example of someone that couldn't resist. Have you guys ever read Sodom and Gomorrah? I only got like 10 more minutes, so hang with me. Sodom and Gomorrah was pretty intense. Sodom and Gomorrah was a community filled with violence, prostitution, drugs, slavery, uh, sacrifices of humans. It was dark. And I don't care how dark you may be right now, maybe some of you are in a very dark place, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally. I don't know your past. You may know someone right now that's in a very dark place, and you know they're wicked. You know they're evil. But let me tell you something, that the sun rises on both the good and the evil. Just don't forget that. The rain falls on the good and evil. Don't forget that. That just shows you how good God is. And so in Sodom and Gomorrah, God was about to whack everybody. Now, don't get it twisted because God's not just a whacker, right? But God is a compassionate God who constantly pursues you to change you and to get you to come to him and to get you to change. Because Satan, the devil, wants you. He wants to destroy you. What does God do? God wants to love you. God wants to heal you. God wants to give you a hope with a future. What do we do? We keep feeding on Sodom and Gomorrah. But there was a man by the name of Abraham, and Abraham was a great man of faith. He was known as the father of faith. Abraham shows up to Sodom and Gomorrah, and he looks at, at, at the city, and he just, he's broken. And he begins to intercede for them. He prays for them. Mom, dads, don't ever stop praying for your kids. Grandparents, don't ever stop praying for your grandchildren. But he starts praying, and he starts talking to God, and he says, God, if there was 100, 100 faithful, there was 100 people of righteousness. Would you save this city? And God said, yeah, I'll save it. And then Abraham keeps saying, what about if there was like, 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 like 50? If there were 50 righteous, would you still save the city? Would you stop your idea of trying to wipe it out? And God said, you know what, Abraham, if there were 50 righteous, I would save it. And there Abraham, now he's anointing God. And he says, God, <laughs> just one more time, if there was one, just one righteous person, just one person that loved you, that believed you, that pursued you, would you save this entire city? You know what God said? I'll save it. So don't tell me that God's not filled with grace. But the problem was that there wasn't one. And so Abraham looked at his, at his cousin Lot, and he said, Lottie, Get your wife, get your kids, let's go, man. God's about to wipe this place out. And sure enough, we know the story. Read with me Genesis 19 quickly. And he says, and as soon as the angels had brought them out, one of them spoke. And he said, run for your lives. The angels talk. Don't look back. Don't do what? Don't, look back. Don't what? Don't, look back. Don't what? Don't look back. Paul said, the one thing I do is what? Don't look back. And you know what? It's hard not to look back when you have been comforted by your past for so long. It's been a pacifier for you. Because you've learned to coexist with it. And when you learn to coexist with something, it's like a drug. You just can't get enough of it. 
And to get enough of it would be normal. And you don't know what normal looks like. You only know what dysfunction feels like. So we keep pacifying ourselves with our past. And so it says, don't look back. Don't stop anywhere in the valley. Run to the mountains. And if you don't, you will be swept away. However, verse 26, but Lot's wife looked back. <laughs> Come on. That girl couldn't let go of her home. She couldn't let go of her family. She couldn't let go of her friend. And I get it. I get it. She just couldn't let it go. I, that's, that's, that's my home. How can, you, how can you just learn to just live in, in hell? I'll tell you why. You coexist with it. Hell becomes normal. Why? Because our lies have become our truth and God's truth have become our lies. But Lot's wife looked back, and when she did, she became a pillar made out of salt. So just think about this. She's, they're running. You come up, Lexus. They're running, and, and she just says, he, I, heard, I heard God said, don't look back. I, I just got one more time. Shh. You see, Satan loves it when we look back because he knows there is a curse of pillar of salt when we do. So his goal is to get you to keep looking back. Because looking back means that you are now paralyzed. Let me give you some fears. Look at this. Fear is faith in our enemy. Fear is false evidence appearing real. Fear is a dark room where all of our negatives are developed. Fear will paralyze us from discovering our true identity in Christ. And this one, don't forget this. Write this down if you're a note taker. If you're not, take a picture and Instagram it. Fear will blur our reality of a living and most powerful God. Fear will tell you there is no God. Please. Don't let the enemy take another hour of your day. Don't let the enemy take another month, another year. So what happens to Lot? Lot ends up running into a cave. And he runs into a cave because he's depressed that his wife is no longer with him. She's dead. He runs into a cave because not only was he depressed... But he's now disappointed, and he's discouraged, and he's deep in the cave. You see, sometimes when, when it's time to let go of some things, it may bring you into a cave for a season. But God never created you to live in a cave. God created you to live openly and free. Because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. So he's all about freedom. And so he goes into this cave and he's got all these fears and worries. And, and let me tell you, parents, please be very careful how you live your life because you may be living in your past right now and thinking, well, that's my past. Leave me alone. That's my hurt. But in reality, you are sowing that same spirit because fear is a spirit. You're sowing that spirit of fear into your children and your children's children. It's a spirit. It gets on them. So you have to use wisdom. Why would you want to link up and hook up and shack up with spirit of fear when all it does is paralyze you? That is an environment. It will shape you and it will form you. Just like when you come to church, hopefully, I hope, I'm able to encourage you and empower you. And when you leave this place, God has touched you and you leave with an extra step inside your spirit, man, right? Well, guess what? In your home, there's a spirit. And hopefully it's not a spirit of fear. That keeps leading you into a cave. I want to remind you today that God knew about this cave throughout the Bible. All throughout the Bible, there were men and women who were always running to caves when things got rough. When events and experiences literally came to destroy them, they would run because they were just worried, depressed, dis, dis, disheartened, you name it, all the disses. But then Jesus said, you see, I got to break that spirit. He said, I got to break that mindset. 
I got to break that past. You know what Jesus did? Jesus and God had a conversation, and God said, son, here's what we're going to do. You see, we can, we, can, we can make your story where they put you in the ground. But yet, better yet, we're going to make an alteration in your story. And we're going to put you in a cave. Because the story that I'm going to come up with is that the tomb is empty. The story I'm going to come up with is that the cave is clear. Jesus is no longer in the tomb. The cave is empty. What a great picture. What a great story God gave us. That we don't have to live in caves. We don't have to live depressed. We don't have to live disheartened. We don't have to live discouraged. God's saying, I'm wooing you out of that cave today. I'm bringing you out. Come on, I'm bringing you out of that cave. Why? Because if you don't come out of that cave, listen, please, I'm almost done. Don't get distracted. If you don't get out of that cave, your cave will turn into a grave. It'll be a grave of lost dreams. It'll be a grave of a lost calling. It'll be a grave of broken relationships. You cannot stay in that cave. You must come out of the cave. The power of the cross is an empty grave. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. The power of the cross of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is an empty grave. He is risen. Come on. The force is with you. Jesus is with you. There's an awakening God wants to do with you. Do you guys want that awakening? Can we give the Lord a big hand clap of praise? close with this Gideon Judges 6, 12 and 16 he's hiding in a cave the Midianite army is wiping out all the Israelites they can never build maybe you've been someone that has not been able to rebuild your life, you've just been one struggle after the next struggle one challenge after the next challenge, you're just struggling and struggling, your kids are jacked up, your family's messed up it's just constant, you can't even get out of poverty your, 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 your ancestors were poor and your parents were poor you're poor, we gotta break that and so the angel of the Lord comes to a man named Gideon who's hiding in a cave a cave of fear and he appeared to him and he said, mighty warrior. Everybody say, mighty warrior. See, aren't you glad that God doesn't look at you in your current state? He looks at you in your future state. He says, you mighty warrior. The Lord is with you. But Sir Gideon replied, you say, the Lord is with us? Then why has all of this happened to us? Where are all of the wonderful things that he has done? Our parents told us about them. They said, didn't the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now... The Lord has deserted us here. Uh, he handed us over to the Medians. How many know that God doesn't like talking about your past? He only likes talking about your future. If you really want God to talk about your past, you know what happens? You're going to be hopeless. Why? Because you'll be reminded of how horrible you are. So that's why God says, let's not talk about your past. Let's talk about your future. Why? Because he knows that talking about your future makes you hopeful. He wants you to be full of hope. Why would you want to talk about your past? Why? And the Lord turned to Gideon and he said to him, listen, you're strong, bro. You're strong. Lady, you're strong. But you don't know what they did to me. <laughs> and you can just cry. And God is not going to talk about what they did to you. He's going to talk to your inner man, your inner woman, and say, you are strong. You're strong. You're better than that. You're bigger than that. You're strong, but I feel weak. You're strong. You're strong, but, but you don't know what they did to me. You're strong. Go and save Israel from the power of the Midians. I am sending you, but, but Lord, Gideon asked, how can I possibly save Israel? My family group, look at this, here goes identity. My family group is the weakest in the tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least important. Can somebody say identity issues? When you live in a cave, you are bound to be in a place of not knowing who you are. And he says, 
I'm the weakest of my tribe. We're the least important person in my own family. And the Lord answered, listen, I didn't ask you what degree you have. I said I'll be with you. So you will strike down the men of Midian. And you're going to strike them all at one time. I'm here to tell you that God is saying to you today, you got this. You got this. You can. Gideon is now, he's in, he's in the wine press. And as he's in the wine press, he's doing what you don't do in a wine press. He's threshing the wheat. You don't thresh wheat if you speak to a farmer. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. What you do in a wine press is you press wine. So many of us are doing things and living things that you were never called to live in. And God's saying, what you doing? What are you doing in here? Why are you acting like that? Why are you thinking like that? That's not who you are. You're not a wine press. You're a thresh, wheat, whatever. You know what I mean. And so he calls him out of his cave. And so he's going to go now and save the Israelites. And he gathers 32,000 men. 32,000 men. And now he's in his elevator. Moving on up. Moving on up. Y'all remember that? He's in his elevator. And God said, Gideon, the men that you have on this level, they got too much fear. They got to get off. He's like, what? You got to get off the field. He brings them from 32,000 to 10,000 men. All right. All right, guys. <laughs> we got this. And moving on up, moving. Gideon. Yes, Lord. You still got too many fearful ones with you. What? Get them off. 300 are left. Two. 300 against 142,000 Midianites. See, God does that because God will never agree with what you and I think need in order to be what God has called us to become. Never. Uh, I'll, I'll give my life to God when I get my life right. When I stop drinking, I'll give my life to God. Yeah, I'm sure you don't be the guy or the girl that lives when I, when I, then I will. No, you won't. If you can't will now, you won't will later. Will is now. Will. I will. It's your will. And how do I do that, Pastor? How do I do that? Okay. Last thing. The Bible says this. Close your Bibles. Let's get out of here. The Bible says this. It says that God's word it's like a double-edged sword. Don't get nervous. I know how to handle these. I am. I'm a knife collector. God says, my word, revelations, my tongue is a double-edged sword. But let me explain something to you because many of you that might not study the Bible, I've studied this. When God speaks of his word being a sword, it's not a complete sword until... Let me explain. See, one side of the edge of the double-edged sword is God's word. But it doesn't complete itself until the other edge does what it does. And that edge is you. That's why he said, and call those things that are not as though they were. See, right now, you may feel like you're crap. You may feel like you're not worth, worth it. You may not feel like you're anything. But you have to start speaking what God said. See, a double-edged sword is just speaking what God already said about you. I am the righteousness of God. Stand to your feet. Say it with me. I am the righteousness of God. Say it with me. I am the righteousness of God. Say it with me. I am highly favored. Say it like you mean it, church. Come on. I am highly favored. I am blessed coming in 
and I'm blessed leaving. Come on. I am the head and not the tail. I am above and I'm not beneath. Come on. You got to start changing or exchanging your words of death and start speaking the life of God. I am. I am. I am His. I am healed. I am free. I am a lover of what is good. I am a peace maker. I am a peace keeper. I am that I am because he is. You got to come back to I am. And we know that Gideon, he wiped out 142,000 with one blow. But before he did that, you know what he did? Before he did anything, Gideon said, my Lord, I will build you an altar. See, hopefully today you connected with the Father. And when you connect with the Father, there must be a spiritual activation. And what Gideon did is what he built this altar of worship and he did it on purpose because he, he called that place the place of victory. And he built the altar and, and it was amazing and it was transformation. It was awesome. I'm here to tell you today, today you need to build the altar of your heart where you say, Father, please forgive me. I submit to you. I submit to you my ideas. I submit to you my anger. I submit to you my, my bad attitude. I submit to you my feelings about you. I don't know where you're at, but you have to submit it to him. And that's building an altar unto your heart. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.